Welcome to Coastal Front. Join us each week as we sit down with the movers and shakers of Vancouver to discuss stories of business, politics, accomplishment, and failure. Our aim is to keep you dialed into what matters most in our city. Now, here's your host, Andrew Johns. I just had the fascinating conversation with John McConnell, President and CEO of Victoria Gold Corp. John grew up in the mining industry. He lived in a town called Emerald City in the Kootenays that doesn't even exist anymore with a father who was a miner. Having gone, grown up in this industry, John has had plenty of experience from working with uh, big companies like De Beers and many other small exploration companies, mostly in northern Canada. John is running Victoria Gold Corp from the day it was started as a uh, junior miner up to the point now where they're about to launch into becoming a gold producer in the Yukon. This guy knows more about gold than pretty much anybody I've ever met. Fascinating conversation with John McConnell. Have a listen. Great. Super excited here to have John McConnell, CEO and president of Victoria Gold with me today. John, thanks for coming on to the show. Great to be here. Now, John, uh, you are the president and CEO of Victoria Gold. You guys have a project up in the Yukon, and uh, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But uh, um, I wanted to start off by uh, talking a little bit about the the gold sector in general, um, and you know, want to give some op- opportunity to educate some of the maybe more amateur investors out there about like what, what does gold investing mean. Uh, but I also wanted to talk a little about uh, about your background. We we're talking just before the show started about where you grew up. Now you grew up in a town that doesn't even exist anymore. Yeah, I grew up in a mining town. It was called Emerald City. Yeah. Uh, it was a lead zinc mine. Uh, my dad was uh, an, an underground electrician there. So, uh, uh, you know, it's in so my blood. You're, you're, you're destined for this. Yeah. Where is Emerald, where was Emerald City? So in the West Kootenays, uh, there's Trail and Nelson would be the largest cities. And it's kind of in between those two. Okay. Uh, right on the uh, Canada-U.S. border. And did you say it was an underground mine? Yes. Okay. Underground. Oh, wow. Wow. So it must, there was only a, a peop, just a small number of families that lived out in a camp there? What was it? It, it was we, a town site. Was so town, there okay. was probably 50 houses. Yeah. You know, maybe yeah. 300 people with dogs and cats. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so you grew up there uh, most of your life and then... Uh, Left, left there at some point later to get yeah, into... I, you know, the mine shut down, I think, in 1973. Yeah. The same year I graduated from high school and I went off to uh, university. And then a couple of years later, came back and worked in a different mine in that area. Okay. Um, and was an underground miner for three or four years and thought, I don't want to be doing this my whole life. So <laughs> I went back to university and became a mining engineer. Okay. And where, where did you go to school for that? Uh, Colorado School of Mines. Oh, wow. Okay. Is that, is that uh, a, a kind of a well-known school for people who are in the mine? Yeah. If, you know, I think everybody says their alma mater is the, the best, but uh, Colorado School of Mines has the reputation of being the best mining school in the world. Yeah. And uh, now, like, obviously, there's lots of different types of metals out there in Victoria Gold, but just by its name as a gold company. But have you always been involved in specifically gold mining or, uh, you know, other than growing up in a, in a family where it was more around sounds like zinc, but have you have, uh, been involved with lots of other different mining types of enterprises? Yeah. So, you know, when I graduated, I uh, moved up into Nunavut. Okay. To a lead zinc mine called Nana Civic. Okay. Um, so I spent the next, uh, you know, more than 12 years working at a zinc, lead zinc mine. At the same location? Yeah. And where, whereabouts, I mean, we, I'd love to bring it up on a map, Ross. Uh, <laughs> whereabouts in Nunavut is this? Uh, the north tip of Baffin Island. So, north. uh, you know, I think the latitude was uh, 73 degrees. So I think the Arctic Circle's at 68. So we were five degrees uh, above the Arctic Circle. <laughs> really? Yeah. And you spent 12 years there. Yeah, I think uh, there was a break in between. Spent four years there. Then I worked out of Toronto for four years. And then I went back and was there for eight more years. So you went from Toronto to this place back and forth. Yeah. Like it's a major culture shock, I'm sure, between the two. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so have you found it here? Is this the is this around the right location? John? Yeah, very top of the island though. What, what was the name of the mine again? Nana Civic. How do you spell that? Actually, if you Google Arctic Bay, it'll probably. Yeah. That was the nearest Inuit community. Wow. So who owned this mine when you were there working there at the time? Well, it was, you know, interesting ownership because it was a Calgary Junior called uh, Mineral Resources International. Okay. But other partners were actually the Canadian government, the federal government, um, Medell Gazelle Shaft, which was a German uh, base metal smelting company. Okay. Um, yeah, and ownership changed at a certain point, and then it was owned by a company called Breakwater Resources. Oh, yeah, Breakwater, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I worked for Breakwater for a number of years as well. Oh, did you really? Yeah. Yeah. I actually knew a few of the people from Breakwater myself, actually, so uh, I forget the CFO's name at the time, John, I think it was. Uh, but, okay, that's that's interesting. Now, one of the things I always wonder about is... Yeah, there, you can see where there. exactly where it is there. Yeah, in our, near Arctic Bay. I've always wondered, how does somebody find um, mineral exploration and eventually build out a mine in a place so... Like, like did someone just walk along and sort of, well, this looks like it'd be a good place for... Uh, <laughs> for a mine <laughs> well you know i think people knew the general geology okay and uh but it was actually found by two prospectors that uh i think traveled up from winnipeg yeah by dog team and <laughs> it was over a three-year period and they were the discoverers that's incredible yeah wow imagine being that doing that back in <laughs> back in the old days yeah so okay so that was your kind of first intro and many years of uh, experience getting into this business uh, of mining after school um what what else did you kind of do before you got into victoria gold anything else was kind of interesting yeah i mean then i moved into the diamond business uh you know uh with a company called windspear diamonds okay they found the snap lake diamond deposit in the northwest territories okay um, eventually, Windspear got bought out by De Beers. Okay. And I went to work for De Beers and uh, took the uh, Snap Lake diamond deposit through permitting, engineering, construction, and into operations. Wow. Then I left uh, De Beers and went to work for a junior called Western Celtic. Okay. And we had the Cucho Creek. Uh, zinc copper project in northeastern bc that's being developed now wow um and we we actually got bought out by sherwood copper now capstone okay and uh you know then i it and during that period i joined the board of victoria resources oh it was called victoria resources at the yeah. time and and your introduction to the company was by being coming becoming a board member that's correct okay and uh, so, you know, Victoria was an early stage projects in Nevada. Okay. Um, and this was in 2007, eight, and then we had the big financial collapse in the fall of 2008. We saw that as an opportunity. And with Kinross's help uh, financially, we went out and acquired two companies, one called Gateway, which gave us more assets in Nevada, and a company called Strath. Stratagold, which gave us a uh, eagle asset in the Yukon. Over the next couple of years, we evaluated those and eventually decided to sell off our Nevada assets and focus on eagle in the Yukon. Okay. And that's what's brought you to kind of the stage you're at now. Right now that's right. Uh, which is really exciting. Before we get into that, actually, this is a good segue about stages of, of mining because and I think Victoria Gold's a great example because you're now at, what stage are you at now in, in Victoria Gold what would you describe your current stage right now well we're in construction in construction okay. you know and uh, we're we're probably 90 percent complete on construction today and then mm -hmm. we'll go into operations uh, this summer okay so Let's go back to the very beginning when these prospectors, let's say, for example, went up to uh, the Eagle location. Let's pretend that they went up there and dog sled, and that's uh, 
they're staking out a claim. What would you? What's that first stage called? Is, is there <laughs> well, a name for it? Well, in this case, uh, you know, this area was goes back to the Klondike Gold Rush days. Really, you know, most of the focus was south of Dawson in the Klondike. Yeah, but there was also exploration and people out uh, prospecting and placer mining in in our area. And, sorry, what's placer mining? What is that? So that's. Uh, getting the gold out of the gravels. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I didn't really realize what that word meant. I've heard it before, but, uh, well, and there's still a very large placer mining industry in the Yukon. Oh, is there? Yeah. Yeah. So, and by the way, Ross, let's bring up on the map, Google maps, where the Eagle, uh, it, it's called Eagle Creek. Um, it's near the community of Mayo, and it's called, it's just called Eagle. Oh, Eagle. Okay. And what's, Community, I think community of, sorry, what Mayo, was it? M-A-Y-O. M-A-Y-O. Okay. And um, uh, so so you've got uh, first stage, which would be like staking a claim. Correct. And, and then the next stage would be, they call it early stage. Well, I'd say even before staking, you would be out there with a, a pan looking for signs of gold or copper or other mineralization okay all right and okay. once you think you found something then you would stake a claim gotcha and uh, you might do some trenching yeah uh, followed by some diamond drilling okay and uh you know if you it looks more encouraging like you know then you would uh expand the diamond drilling okay so when we acquired uh what we refer to as the Dublin Gulch property, which hosts Eagle Deposit, um, it was at what I would call an advanced exploration stage. Okay. And, uh, you know, so there'd probably been 50 drill holes done and there'd been, uh, you know, a lot of mapping. And this is not, uh, you know, a new discovery. It probably goes back to, uh, you know, 1980s. Okay. And uh, so we acquired it. We spent the next eight years developing it. Um, more diamond drilling, infill drilling, uh, environmental baseline data collection, uh, entering the permitting process in the Yukon. Uh, so, you know, that all took us eight years. And then it took us a year to put the financing together. And roughly a year ago, we started construction. So, so this is not a get quick, get rich quick program by any means. Well, you know, <laughs> we acquired the property in uh, June of 2009. Yeah, we'll be pouring gold uh, in September of 2019. So, as my chairman likes to say, we'll have been a 10-year overnight success. <laughs> and can I ask? You said that construction is about 90% done now. Correct. And started a year ago, so it, it takes, you know, a little bit over a year. Is that typical, a year to, from construction start um, to finish? It varies, you know. Uh, you know, some mines take two or three years to build. Wow. This is a very simple mining operation. It's, you know, an open pit and valley leach. So okay. not as complicated as the diamond mine we built in uh, the NWT. Yeah. Okay. Um so going back to just one other thing on on staking claims, uh, we had a my uh, another guest on the show a, f a couple of weeks ago, Bart Jaworski. I don't know if you know Bart. I know Bart quite well, yeah. actually. Yeah, Bart's great. I had breakfast and, with him a few weeks ago. Oh, okay, perfect. <laughs> so Bart Bart uh, has been he spent a lot of time up in the Yukon, and he was telling me uh, that apparently if you want to stake claims in the Yukon, or at least I don't know if this is the case today, but it, it was that you you still even in sort of the current days you have to actually physically go up there and that's is, correct yeah you actually physically have to put stakes in the ground <laughs> <laughs> wow that's amazing do people do that still do you think well actually uh, you know you know my wife tara we staked some claims last summer did you really yeah so you really got to literally go up there with some some wood picks and some and some hammers or something how does that work no you have to dig a hole and put up the post really and these are big posts they're yeah. six inch by six inch by eight feet 
Wow. <laughs> they want to know you're committed. That's right. <laughs> wow, that's really interesting. So, so you've had lots of experience in uh, mostly northern Canada, and, and uh, obviously this project's in the Yukon. What's it like doing business in the Yukon? If you could be yeah, quite I honest, think like uh, you know, I think uh, if you were in the mining business, the best jurisdiction in Canada is probably Quebec. Okay, followed very closely by the Yukon. And why is that? I, the regulatory process is understandable. Um, you know, one real big advantage in the Yukon is uh, land claims have been settled with the First Nations. Okay. So, you know, lots of First Nations people, uh, you know, 40% 40, 40 of our employees are First Nations. Oh, wow. Um, but, uh, you know, the Yukon has long history of mining going back to the Klondike Gold Rush. So yeah. people know mining. And more importantly, they know the economic benefits mining brings. So yeah, sure. Um, that really helps if you're, you know, when you're going through the permitting process. And having settled land claims just means you know who you're dealing with uh, in terms of the First Nation. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And I'm assuming that mining is a big part of the U Yukon economy. Um, not as much as you'd think. Okay. You know, when we go into production later this year, we'll be the only operating mine in the Yukon, other than placer mining. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. But there's a long history of mining in the Yukon. Yeah, yeah. Now, is gold the only mineral that you will uh, effectively mine from this location, or does it? are there other minerals that you get as a byproduct, or how does that work? We'll produce a little bit of silver. Okay. But uh, as I tell people, it'll just to ensure we can have a nice Christmas party. It's, uh, <laughs> our major production is gold. Okay. So you've had to go through this uh, recent process of doing some financings, and you just closed the financing recently. Um, at this point now, uh, what are kind of your biggest challenges ahead? Because you, you're past the permitting, right? That's why you've got the ability to build a mine now? Yeah, no, you know, everything is going well we're uh -huh. fully permitted we're you know 90 percent through construction uh we're fully financed so there are no hurdles yeah uh, left you know uh it's mainly all, just execution it's execution and getting into operations yeah and you've had this experience before from the 12 years you spent at that other location and yeah in both you know we took uh, both nana civic and snap lake into production so yeah now you'd mentioned that this is an open pit mine with this uh something valley leech valley leech what so i'm not really I, as you can tell just by my questions i'm not much <laughs> of a mining uh, expert what is a valley leech what does that mean so very simple and you know i should also say uh you know we've copied a lot of our designs from Kinross's Fort Knox mine in Alaska, okay. where they also use Valley Leach. Okay. But basically we've taken a, you know, um, use the geography to our, or topography to our advantage. There's a nice large valley there. We've removed all of the organic material and lined it with three liners and we will pile the rock in there then we will put cyanide on. Cyanide dissolves the gold, then the, and it runs down to the bottom. We collect it, put it into a gold recovery plant. Where the the we, gold falls to the bottom. Yeah. Gotcha, okay. And we strip the gold off, and then we recycle the cyanide and reuse it. Oh, wow. That's real, wow, that's really, you know, I saw on your video that you've got these phenomenal videos. And by the way, should do a little plug for the website uh, where I'm assuming you can see, find the videos I, I found on YouTube, but on your website as well. So what's the Victoria Gold website? Uh, VITGoldCorp.com. VITGoldCorp.com. And here it is here. Um, and and so I saw this thing being built. This It looked like a, almost like a... I looked at it, it almost looked like a snowboarding tube park that was being built. <laughs> um, and so that, what is that black material that's being laid down? What is that? Material? It's a plastic liner. It's a pla okay. Uh, quite a thick liner actually. Okay. And we do three liners, so. Three liners, okay. So this makes it kind of impermeable so that yeah. obviously you don't want the cyanide 
you, you know, and we don't want it to get into the environment. No, we want to control yeah. it. I imagine that um, I'm assuming environmental practices were uh, an afterthought 20, 30 years ago, but today it's got to be probably front and center. And I'm assuming it's also somewhat regulated, is it? Or Oh, very, very much regulated. Yeah. Uh, you know, it took us five years to get through the per- permitting process in the Yukon. And uh, people want to make sure that, uh, you know, you're not going to harm the environment and you're going to return the land to the way it was. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, is that is that a big part of the permitting, just getting all the environmental kind of check, checking all those boxes? Is that a big part of what gets you the permit to be able to do what you're doing now? Yeah. I mean, they look at, you know, what your impacts could possibly be, and then you have to mitigate them. I see. Yeah. Um, and what's, what's a tailings pond? What is that? So that's different. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, that's if you're milling the ore. Okay. So in the case of... Uh, what's milling mean? Means you grind it down to baby powder. Oh, I see. Okay. And uh, then the tailings is what's left over. Oh, okay. And so it's in a, you know, more of a slurry form and uh, eventually it settles out, but uh, gotcha. you're storing it in a large uh, pond. Okay. And is, and so, but you're not doing that. You're doing a, a different model. Is yeah, this is a, a valley leach. Valley so leach. We crush the rock, but we yeah. don't mill it. Okay, okay. And is there was there an option? For, I mean, what what makes you decide between doing a valley leach versus doing leaching versus virtu- or yeah, I guess leaching. Yeah, it versus yeah. A couple things. One is metallurgy. Okay. So not all deposits are leachable. Okay. And the other is economics. Uh, yeah. It obviously, it costs more money to grind rock down to baby powder size than it is to crush it to, say, one inch. Okay. Oh, so it's, I had this envision that when you say crushing it down, I'm still thinking they're like, you know, soccer ball size rocks. This is still crushed down pretty. Pretty fine. Pretty, pretty fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that's, that's really interesting. Um, what about the difference between choosing to do open pit, which is an obvious uh, like concept versus a, uh, I guess in, what do you call that in underground mine? Is it yeah. It, and again, it depends on the deposit, uh, depends on the economics. Uh, yeah. in our case, it's a very large deposit and it's very suitable for open pit mining. Yeah. Um, you know, another one could be a vein type deposit and, you know, you'd have to mine it by underground means. Okay. Now, Ross, if we can go back to that um, map for a moment uh, of the the location of the Eagle project, and and if we can look at it in a satellite view, I'd just be really interested to see. Like, would, could we see from a satellite? I'm assuming the camp, as long as the uh, images are current with Google, uh, I'm wondering if we can see what it would look like from a from a satellite image. That's a good question. I've never tried that. Yeah. So the the community of Mayo is is it really close to the community? About sixty five kilometers to the south, or we're sixty five kilometers to the north to the of north. the community of Mayo. Okay. It, com- it might be tricky to find on here. Yeah, I think it would be. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah, that's really interesting. So with with respect to um, to uh, pouring gold. Like what, what, what's involved in that? When you say pour, like, do you are you going to heat up the gold at some point, and you actually create bricks right up there? Is that how? It, yes. Oh wow. <laughs> so do you get to like put your little fingerprint on the first brick? You know, kind of like when you're pouring cement and you. Put no, I don't, it's pretty hot. Oh yeah, I guess so. <laughs> What about uh, infrastructure? How does that work? I mean, that must be a factor in like power and roads and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, we're very fortunate where we're located. We have a paved highway runs within 40 kilometers of the project site. Yeah. Uh, We've built an all weather gravel road into Eagle. So we have year round road access. We've just completed uh, a power line uh, from Eagle out to uh, near Mayo. Okay. And we'll connect into Yukon Energy's power grid, uh, which is 95% hydroelectric power. Wow. 
Uh, we actually energized the line just yesterday. So uh, oh, nice. Yeah. So everybody's got some electricity now. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. Is that why you were up there? You were on site this week? Yeah. No, I wasn't up there particularly for that. Right. I try and get up every two weeks to yeah walk around and take it all in. Yeah. Wow. It's got to be an exciting time for you right now with this stage. Yeah. No, it's very exciting. Now you travel a lot with your work, don't you? Yeah, I'm on the road pretty much every week. Wow. Particularly with the construction, you know, as being the CEO of a, a junior, you've got to be marketing a lot. Okay. And uh, I, every chance I get, I fly up to the Yukon and get up to the mine site so I can see what's going on. And then, and then turn around and speak to the, the masses that are list, attending your, you know, your meetings and whatnot and tell them what's happening. That's right. Okay. So, uh, uh, Tara had mentioned to me that you, you are like a, you're like 2 million miles now on your, <laughs> what, what, what? well, I've been flat. I think that's over the last 10 years on Air Canada. I'm well over 2 million mile flyer. <laughs> You probably start to get to know the staff there, and they probably get to know who you are. Oh, I certainly know some of the uh, flight attendants. <laughs> They're like, they oh, hello, Mr. Me. McConnell. Nice to see you again. Yeah. <laughs> what happens when you get to that? I mean, I almost, I almost uh, not sure if I should congratulate you or feel <laughs> sorry for you. What happens when you get, because I always see these people with these tags that say like 100,000 kilometers, but that's just for that year, right? Yeah. You know? So do you get any kind of special pen or anything when you, when you get to 2 million miles? I think when I uh, got 2 million, I got a set of Bose headphones or something. <laughs> but uh, the other benefit is, uh, you know, when, when I became a million mile flyer, I got uh, elite status for life. Oh, wow. And when I got to... Two million. I was able to give Tara elite status for life. Well, she probably deserves it. Yeah, if you traveling that much. <laughs> <laughs> they should probably give it to the spouse first. Oh, well, she travels yeah. with me a lot, so yeah. uh, we try and uh, she comes along with me. And you know, our five-year-old. Yeah, she's probably done in excess of three hundred flights since she was born. <laughs> oh wow. Yeah. So she's going to be, uh, she'll be up there soon too. She'll that's be, right. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Well, great. Well, uh, John, we'll, we'll come back here in a minute. Uh, really happy to have you here on the show today. And uh, we'll, we'll carry on our conversation with John McConnell in just a minute. Great. So back here with John McConnell, president and CEO of Victoria Gold. John, thanks for being here. Uh, so you're working on this project right now. You're hoping to pour gold uh, later on this fall. Do you have other projects you're working on right now with respect to Victoria Gold? No, 100% of my time and focus of my team is on getting Eagle built. You know, uh, you're not the first person that asks that question. You know, now we're almost in production. Everybody says, well, what's next? What's next, yeah. Well, we've got at least another 12 months of hard work to get this one up and running properly. So uh, it's got to be our focus. Yeah, 100%. It's like when you get married and the first question you get asked the day after you get married is when are you having kids? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that's really exciting. So um, let's talk a little bit about numbers. Um, what does it cost to build a mine like this? So in round numbers, the capital cost is 500 million. 500 Canadian. million. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. How, how much money has been, sp before you even started construction, like if you look at all the work, and I, I don't even know if you know this number, but how much money do you think was spent from the days when you started with as a director at Victoria, it wasn't even called Victoria Gold, it was called Victoria Resources, Resources and all that exploration kind of activity and drilling and all the 10 years of what you went through, what, what kind of dollars do you think were spent to get to where you're at today? Roughly about uh, somewhere between 130 and 150 million. Wow. And, you know, I say roughly because it depends on you, you include oh. Victoria G&A in that or just the amount of money that was spent on mm -hmm. the development. Right, right, because you have other projects and things. Yeah. Like, okay. So let's call it 130 million, and now it's another 500 million to build. Yeah. So you're into this thing for 630 million. And Based on what, what, what are gold prices at right now? Do you even know? 
Yeah, well, gold trades. I would uh, hope you know. <laughs> today it's, uh, I don't know, I think 1276. Okay. In U.S. dollars. U.S. dollars. Yeah, 1276. And uh, so what kind of total revenue will you expect to generate from this project? Well, again, just to use nice round numbers yeah. to make it easy. Uh, you know, we'll produce an ounce of gold. It'll cost us $750 U.S. Okay. In all of our economics analysis, we use 1250 gold as a price. Okay. So 1250 minus 750 is a $500 ounce margin. Okay. We produce 200,000 ounces of gold per year. Yes. So this little company will be cash flowing $100 million a year in a full production. After, when you say cash flowing, you mean basically sort of gross sort of gross profits after that cost, the, those costs of pulling that. That's right. Wow, 100 million. And then, and how many years do you think you can do this for? Well, the feasibility study, Mine Life, is just under 11 years. Okay. Um, but we continue to do exploration. The deposit is open below the currently planned open pit. Okay. So my gut tells me this mine will run for 20 to 30 years. Oh, wow. That's a long time. You going to be there for the whole thing? <laughs> no. <laughs> this has got to be, I would assume, though, that this has got to be a pretty big accomplishment as somebody in your industry who spent your entire life in mining to get on involved in a junior and see it all the way through to where you're actually producing. I mean, that's not, is that a very common thing? No, I think it's probably very rare that, you know, one, you stick around for the 10 years of, you know, banging your head against the wall in permitting processes. And, you know, as we said, it costs, say, $130 million. So, you know, you have to uh, hit the markets pretty regularly to raise that money just then to go out and raise another $500 million to build it. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's very common. Yeah. Well. And that's why you rarely see juniors building a mine. Yeah, sure. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, you, a lot of times, I guess, once they've got that big find, uh, so to say, so to speak, you, they, I guess, sell sell to like a bigger mining company, Correct. right? Correct. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any uh, other partners, uh, management or board who've kind of been with you most of the way through this journey? Well, actually, yes. Uh, my CFO, uh, a fellow named Marty Rendell, yeah. he's been with me for probably 25 years now, three different companies. Wow. First met at Breakwater, and then we were together at, at De Beers, and now we're together at Victoria. Um, and when we acquired uh, Stratigold in and the Dublin Gulch property in 2009, one of the employees was a fellow named Mark Arantel. Okay. And he's, uh, I'm fortunate I have two, two ICs in those two men. And What's uh, an IC? <laughs> uh, second in command. Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, they've been with me the whole time. And the chairman of our board, he and I joined the Victoria board at the same time, a fellow named Sean Harvey. Oh, wow. So, okay. you know, the... Four of us have uh, been together at Victoria for more than 10 years now. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Now, Victoria Gold, has has it always been a public company since you joined the board? Yeah. Um, okay. I, you know, I don't know exactly when it was listed, but uh -huh. I think it was 2004. And uh, what was its market cap? Do you remember when you joined? Oh, good question. Um Probably around twenty million, and the market cap today just under four hundred million. Yeah. yeah, amazing. Yeah, wow. And so, what's the share price at roughly right now? I think it's about forty-five cents. Yeah. Okay. Was there ever a point between when you joined and now where it, things did not look good? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, three years ago, the price of gold was down to eleven hundred dollars. Our share price was ten cents, and you know, um, it didn't look like there would be an opportunity to raise the money and build the mine. It didn't look like there'd be enough money, you know, an opportunity to raise uh, $5 million to keep the project advancing. Wow. So that's the, the junior mining business. 
why would you want to do this for a living? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you gotta, you gotta love it. Yeah. And, yeah. or else you should become an accountant yeah. or, uh, <laughs> you know, I was at the optometrist this morning and I was thinking that's gotta be the most boring job in the world, being an optometrist. <laughs> <laughs> well, they get paid really well right now, but now, now with all advances in technology, um, we've got on your website here, your, your team. Now there's a bunch of fellas standing inside a big bucket. This is incredible. You get to have some big toys around, huh? Yeah, we've got two very large shovels. Uh, so the capacity of that bucket is, you know, what does it look like? 10 directors <laughs> or uh, 50 tons of rock. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that particular shovel, it's Caterpillar 6040 shovel. Uh, the engine is uh, 2,000 horsepower, and it roughly burns 2,000 liters of fuel a day. So it's, <laughs> it's a massive shovel. Wow. That's it was incredible. built in uh, Germany. Yes. Then disassembled, put on a ship to Halifax, and then the parts were loaded on trucks and trucked across Canada and up to the Yukon where we reassembled them. That's incredible. Yeah. Do, do you, you know ever, how much a, a machine like this would cost? Uh, about thirty million U.S. for a no, truck. No, that's not that's not true. Sorry, it's about eleven million U.S. each of the shovels. Well, that's just the shovel. Yeah, just the shovel. That's an expensive shovel. <laughs> that's incredible. <laughs> um, do we have any other pictures on here that we might uh, have a look at? I, I saw there was. I know in the video they were showing these trucks driving around. Th this the shovel obviously is being held by one of these massive trucks. Are these the trucks that have these huge wheels that are like bigger than tall, like they're like seven feet tall? Now here's a good image of one. Yeah, that's the shovel there. Yeah. So wait, when you say shovel, are you referring to just the bucket or no, the, whole the whole thing, thing is a shovel, the whole right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, the whole thing, yeah. gotcha. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. There was one more question I had in the video here. There's that huge, uh, the blast. Yeah. Oh yeah. What, what's the purpose of the blast? Is that is that how you guys get down and dig below? Like, is or why, why well, are you blast? That's blasting the ore. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was a really. That's a cool video. Yeah. Like I, I was saying earlier, I, f I feel like uh, you make me feel like I'm a rock star when I'm watching this. Uh, it's like <laughs> there. Yeah. There's the video. Of this. Yeah. What's the white powder being pushed? So down that's uh, the blasting agent, which is ammonia nitrate. Okay. Um, there's the yeah, blast. There's the blast. There. Yeah. That's got to be pretty. Do you get to press the? Do you get to press that button? I haven't had that opportunity yet, actually. But uh, <laughs> you got to put your I've foot down there. That's got to be. That's uh, got to be something. I've done lots of blasting, so. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. So there's the shovel there. Yeah, that's incredible. Big set of stairs going up to the top. That's inside the shovel. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier when I asked you why would you get into this business, you got to kind of love it. You got to be. What are some of the things about this? industry that makes you love it so much why i mean i obviously grew up in it with the your your father but what is it something when you sort of sit back and look at it what do you love the most about being in this industry yeah you know i'm an engineer and uh you know i always said that if i can't look back at the past week and say i learned something new it's time to move on to another job Okay. And I've never had that experience yet in the mining business because, uh, you know, there's so many types of, of mining, both, you know, underground, open pit. There's, you know, many, as we discussed earlier, many different uh, uh, minerals. You know, I've been fortunate to work in lead, zinc, copper, gold, diamonds. Uh, so it's, you know, it's just a fascinating business. Wow. Are there any uh, particular mineral types with all the experience you've had that, like, let's say this gets wrapped up and uh, you're on to your next part of your career, um, assuming you want to continue to work, and uh, <laughs> would there be any mineral type you'd say, I'm never going to work in that space again, or any jurisdiction <laughs> in the world where you wouldn't work? Uh, no. I mean, well, there's jurisdictions I wouldn't want to work. You yeah. know, I spent uh, a couple of years in Zimbabwe and, you know, uh, some of the African countries have no appeal to me. Yeah. Um, Probably quite dangerous. I would you imagine. know, we had a project once in Guyana in South America and, you know, beautiful country. But they've got be beetles the size of your fist and that kind of creeped me out. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> 
Um, so, you know, I'm very comfortable in Canada, in North America in general. I, I'm fascinated by the gold business. Yeah. Um, but uh, even more fascinated by the diamond business. I always thought it was very interesting because, uh, you know, uh, De Beers is really a marketing company, not a diamond mining company. Yeah, don't they have like a huge market share? Yeah, I think they probably still have more than 50% of the diamond business. It's incredible. Yeah. I heard someone once say that uh, when it comes to diamond mining, you know, that, that phrase diamonds last forever. I heard the term once say diamonds take forever. <laughs> well, and, you know, the other one I like is, uh, um, you know, we've been very fortunate in Canada in finding diamond deposits, although I think we're down to two, di three diamond mines operating left in Canada now. But that, you know, finding a Kimberlite pipe is like looking for a specific needle in a haystack of needles. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Now, th th there's uh, when it comes to diamonds produced in Canada, isn't there some kind of appeal because they're not considered blood diamonds? Uh, I I, or is that, is, again, is that part of the whole marketing sh shtick? Yeah, I, I think, you know, there, you know, there were a few movies that made uh, Blood Diamonds. Yeah, Leonardo, dirty Leonardo DiCaprio, yeah. right? He, but, you know, I think most 99% of diamonds are mined properly. Properly, And yeah. there's proper chain of command so you know where it came from. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, or chain of custody, yeah. Yeah, chain of custody. Up in the Yukon where you're at, are there, uh, is, you mentioned the Beatles in Guyana, but I gotta think that, what about grizzlies? And <laughs> is there, are, do you see wildlife much? Yeah, or? we see black bears, brown bears, grizzly bears, uh, lots of moose in the Yukon. Really? Um, you know, elk, deer, lots of uh, beavers. Yeah. You know. But, uh, you know, bears generally don't like man, so when, you know, They'll head over to the other side of the hill. Okay. Now, the moose, quite often we see moose around Eagle because they also know that wolves don't like um, man. But so they're quite comfortable, the moose coming in very close to our camp. Really? And they know that the wolves won't follow them. I didn't even know that wolves hunted moose. Oh, yeah. Wow. That's interesting. I, I had no idea. <laughs> so you get a lot of moose around. Well, and grizzly bear hunt moose too. Okay. Yeah. Is it fair to say that you're probably employing more people right now through the construction period and then there'll be, but there'll be still some permanent employees year round for the ongoing? Yeah, I would say the workforce right now, the construction workforce is pr roughly 700. Oh, 700 people? Yeah, with, you know, 400 on site today. Wow. But, the town uh, of Mayo must like, is there a general <laughs> store in Mayo? There is. He, that owner must be real happy with you. Well, you know, most of our people don't even stop in Mayo. Oh, I see. And, you know, we have a big camp at site, so most people live right at camp. Right, live okay. Okay. Um, but, there, you know, there are some interesting stats, uh, you know, of those 700 right now. As I said, 50% are from the Yukon. Okay. 50% um, are First Nations. Okay, great. And the real interesting stat for me, because I've got a daughter, is that uh, more than 30% of the workers are women. Really? And that's everywhere from mining engineers, geologists. Uh, when I was up there uh, this week, I met two lady journeyman electricians. Well, that's great. You know, the women driving trucks, uh, that big shovel we talked about. We have a lady training to you know, run that big shovel. Oh, that's great. Wow, yeah. that's, that's, that's neat. That's nice to see. I agree with, I've got, as you know, I have two daughters as well. So it's uh, nice to know that there's uh, other opportunities out there for them than, uh, than just being what, you know, the old days, nurses and teachers. Well, even, you know, 15 years ago, you'd go to a mine construction site uh -huh. and you might have, you know, less than 3% women and they were working in the kitchen. They were right. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's great. 
Now, in order to get to the Eagle Project, if somebody wanted to just go out and drive there and visit it, you know, I'm, I'm joking, of course. I don't know if you'd get <laughs> too many people would be that adventurous. But so you got to fly into uh, where to to Dawson City or no? We have really good flight connections, so okay. I can get on a flight here in the morning at uh, 11 a.m. from Vancouver to Whitehorse. Okay, connect up to Mayo. And I can be... Oh, you can fly into Mayo? Yeah, there's seven sked flights a week from Whitehorse to Mayo. Really? Yeah. And uh, then it's about an hour drive to site. So I leave at 11. Oh. I'm on site for dinner that evening. Oh, wow. That's great. Yeah. So I guess if Mayo's got direct flights between Whitehorse and, and Mayo... Does Mayo kind of a hub for some uh, many other smaller communities in that area? Yeah, there's uh, another mine development there. A company called uh, Alexco Resources is uh, going through the permitting process for a silver mine right now. Yeah. Um, there's probably 20 placer mine operations in the area. And then there's a lot of government people that, you know, uh, provide services. There's a, you know, a nursing station in Mayo, uh, that sort of thing. So. Okay. Speaking of government, I'm assuming that they've got to get a piece of the revenue from this as well. What, how does that work with respect to, I don't know, taxes or royalties? Is there any kind of uh, uh, revenue for the Yukon government? Not so much for the Yukon government, but for the federal government. It's all on crown land. Oh, I see. Um, but then there are transfer payments from the federal government back to the Yukon government based on the number of people that live in the Yukon. So, you know, by us, uh, you know, employing 400 people, uh, there'll be a lot more people living in the Yukon and paying taxes. And, oh, I see. That's how it works. Okay. Yeah. That's sort of a macroeconomic system. What, what kind of royalties, or how, is it, are they considered royalties that you pay the federal government, or how does it it's work? It's not really a royalty. Oh, um, what do they call it? It's, it's more of a tax. A Justin Trudeau tax? Yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we'll be paying carbon tax just like the, everybody else. Okay. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So what, what's the, what does that amount to? Is it a fairly big number? Do you no, it's not a huge number, okay. but it's another tax. It's just in one more. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Death by a thousand cuts. Yeah. Okay. Um, anything else, John, that you want to tell us about with uh, Victoria Gold? No, I think we've done a pretty good job of telling the story here. Yeah, well, it's, pretty, it's a neat story. And again, I think it's just, I think it's really interesting to see a guy who's been able to take it with your team, like not just you, but with, you mentioned Marty, who I've met before and your other two colleagues and go from a, like an exploration play all the way out to this and who knows what the future will hold. Yeah. Yeah. Well, John McConnell, thanks for coming on the show today. It was really great having you here. And I learned a lot more about uh, gold mining in the Yukon and, and Victoria Gold. And I really appreciate your time. Well, you're going to have to bring your daughters up for a visit. 100% would love to do so. <laughs> All right. Great. Okay. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Thanks Charles. Yeah. No problem.